Liz Bronson is our speaker. She is a lead recruiter and career coach. She's going to be talking about how to work best with recruiters. So how, how to interact with people of her species. Uh, she is the owner of Liz Bronson Consulting, which is an HR and recruiting company, helping mostly tech startup teams build their people practices, their programs, and values to help them hire and retain their people. Her team focuses on finding the right talent to build an organization through a tailored and individualized approach to recruiting. She is passionate about designing authentic, candidate-centric recruiting processes that match a company's culture. Since starting the company in 2013, her clients have included companies like Hulumi, Auditoria, Signal FX, uh, Evernote, and MyVest. She also does individual career and general management coaching and training and writes articles for LinkedIn, uh, Fairy God Boss, I love that site, Sours, uh, SourceCon, and more. Before being independent, she worked for nine years at VMware, building their product management and marketing teams, and was also a part of the HR team at Barclays Global Investors. She met her husband, in case you're interested, while living in the Bay Area, and after their daughter was born, they moved to Austin in 2007, where less than two years later, their son was born, a baby and a toddler. Congratulations. Well, how happy. When she's not working or making memories with her family, she's active with Generation Serve, a local nonprofit providing children with opportunities to volunteer, going on new adventures, cooking, exercising, laughing with friends, and getting lost in a good novel. Please give a, a warm welcome to Liz Bronson. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you so much. And I'm so honored to be here. Now, let's see if I can actually share my screen. I am going to be talking with you today about working. How do you work with people like me or with recruiters? And I'm conveniently drinking out of my recruiters are barnacles in the ship of lies mug because I know that people think we're absolutely the worst. And recruiters have this reputation, they stop things, they ghost, they do all these things. And as Kathy said in her introduction, I'm really anti all of that. And so my goal today is to kind of take you behind the scenes and teach you a little bit about how to work with recruiters, all the different types of recruiters there are, why they exist, what they do. And so maybe you understand a little bit more what these people that you're interacting with are all about. So in this first slide, I'm asking like, why do, why do we even need these people that, you know, tend to be the blockade between me and getting that job? And what are they really doing? Why aren't they getting back to me? So the first myth um, that I want to dispel is that there is a big difference between the internal recruiter and the external recruiter. So an internal recruiter that works for the company and an external recruiter who has been sort of more detail about all the different recruiters are basically given a job to work on. And again, it's different if you're internal or external and their job is to project manage that job. And that goes from the very beginning of writing that job description and making sure it's going to attract the right candidates to potentially getting it posted either internally or externally and loading it into the applicant tracking system, working with the hiring manager to calibrate and make sure that they understand what they're looking for. And then working with candidates, finding candidates, sourcing candidates, and that's a whole thing. Uh, and then screening them and then making sure they're having a really good candidate experience. So it's a, and then of course there's the offer and negotiation and then getting them all set up for onboarding. So it is a pretty project management heavy task if you think of it that way, that they're making sure that this process of we need a hire to, we gotta hire to get it completed. So that is a huge part of their job. And there's that process piece, right? Where they are managing each part of the recruiting process from posting, sourcing, going through all the resumes, keeping candidates updated, gathering feedback. So they're, oh, hey, did you give your feedback? Did you put it in? What did you think? Can this person move on? Do we need to let them go? So there's a lot of process management and information gathering. And 
why do they exist? Why can't hiring managers just do it themselves? Well, as you can probably tell, it's a lot of work. And so if I'm a engineering manager, I need to be managing the engineering and not necessarily going through all of the resumes that applied for my job. So the recruiting team's job is to understand the company and the job and to leverage the hiring team so that they can do their jobs. So this is one of those jobs where there's always more to do. There's always another place to source. There's always another touch point with each candidate. So it is one of those positions where you are juggling a ton. So we're breaking today. This is all about breaking down who are these people on this recruiting team. And of course, every company, it's a little bit different and inside and outside. But let's break down the different roles that you will find on a company's recruiting team. And I can't say it enough. All companies are slightly different, but these are sort of the different roles that you'll find in recruiting. The first, and sometimes the most important, is the recruiting coordinator. This is the person that maybe you're working with a recruiter and they say the recruiting coordinator is going to set you up or schedule you. So generally, a recruiting coordinator is more administrative. They do a lot of interview scheduling, which is my Achilles heel, um, and they leverage the recruiter's time. So they may keep the database up to date. They are rescheduling when the hiring manager says, oh, I have a conflict at the last minute. So these people are worth their weight in gold and they are the people that keep the trains on the tracks in terms of scheduling. So often your recruiter will put point you to somebody else that will get the interview scheduled. Generally, that person is some sort of recruiting coordinator. The recruiting manager. So at bigger companies, you know, we just heard from AMD, there's not just the individual recruiter, but somebody who manages them and maybe some manage the different groups of recruiters or whatever, depending on how big your company is. And so the recruiting manager has the role of overseeing, overseeing that everybody's being compliant with the applicant tracking system, helping things when they go funky, all of those things. So they're manager of the team. The sorcerer, the secret wizard. So I, my sorcerer on my team is named David. He is my secret weapon. Um, sorcerers are generally more in the background. So they are the people who are out there finding passive candidates. And they're not just on LinkedIn, they're all over the place. So they are on different websites using different um, different Boolean searches. These are really technical people. Some of them are actually coders and things like that, but they their whole goal is to search for candidates. So for example, I have a new head of product marketing role for a Bay Area startup. David's going to be going and looking at speaker lists and finding different product marketing people that have spoken at conferences because this person has to be the voice of, of the product to the customers. So he's not just looking on LinkedIn for product marketing manager, but he's actually finding organically where they exist on the web and tying them. And he does a million other things um, that I don't even understand. But a sourcer's job is to build the pipeline. So if any of you are marketers, you know there's the marketing funnel where you get things from all the prospects down to the sale. Recruiting's the same. You get all the prospects down to the hire. And the sourcer is um, often tasked with filling the funnel. Sometimes at large companies, they're also the ones going through every applicant to see which ones are good and also looking in the applicant tracking system for uh, past applicants or past candidates that would be a good fit. The recruiter, yay, you know, that's, that's your kind of front end person. Sometimes recruiters do sourcing, sometimes they don't. It all depends. Generally, your recruiter is the person that is working with the hiring team as well as working with the candidates. Um, so they do both. And sometimes they're doing sourcing too, which adds a whole lot to the job. Um, and generally, when I'm talking about working very closely with the hiring manager, generally that's more in the internal model versus external. Sometimes external recruiters 
Don't even work with hiring managers at all, but we'll get to that. So your recruiter is basically your touch point. They're generally juggling a ton of roles, sometimes too many. They can have up to 100 candidates, at least on their plate at a time. So they are someone who is kind of the gatekeeper for you, but also someone you can reach out to and say, hey, just looking for an update, real friendly, but you can always ask them for an update because generally they're in the know. Now, you may not know that these people exist, but there are people that their whole job is to make you want to work at a company. They are branding people. They're employment branding people. So not only do I want to, let's say, shop at this store, but I want to work at this store. So they're the ones who do those awesome career pages and the interviews like, oh, I think that this is the greatest company ever to be born. And so they are the ones that are creating the content, be it that you see on social media, be it that you see on the website, but any content around what it's like to work there that is going to attract candidates, those are the employment branding people. So the big question, where does my resume go when I apply online and how do I make it stand out? So when you apply online, be it through Indeed, be it through the company website, be it through LinkedIn, you name, wherever you found the job and it says apply here, where does it go? It goes in a database called the applicant tracking system and it waits to be looked at. And sometimes it waits for a really long time, especially giant companies, even middle-sized companies, well-known companies, Gets, get hundreds and hundreds of applicants. So if you think about that, I'm the recruiter, I might have 10, 15 jobs on my plate and every job might be getting 50 applications a day. It's a lot. And then I have to look at every application and say, does this match what I need? So, in the meantime, I'm also making sure every candidate's going through the process and every candidate's got what they need and interviews have been scheduled. It's a lot. So when we're applying online, the really important thing to know is that your resume is going to be looked at in about two seconds. Two seconds. I can scroll it. I, I'm a bottom-up scroller. It's my thing. But I can scroll it and know if the person's a fit or not in two seconds. Have I been wrong before? Probably hundreds of times, but I do not have time to dissect every resume. It just isn't feasible. And you know, so if you have experience that's relevant to the job, but it's like way back, I'm not gonna, I may not catch it or I may think it's stale. So the insider tip, is when you're applying for jobs, you look at the keywords in the job description and you make sure they're in your resume. Because what I'm looking for is keywords to see if it's a match. So if I'm looking for a, a demand generation person, I'm looking for demand generation in your resume. I'm looking for growth marketing in your resume. I'm looking for SEO. So I'm looking for those keywords that will all be listed in my job. I wanna see them on your resume. If I don't, I'm scrolling past and, and pressing the no thank you button. So your resume may be going into a giant database. Your resume may never be gotten to until the end. And that's why sometimes you're like, I applied to that job three months ago and now I got a rejection. That's because they filled it and they didn't look, they never saw your resume because it went into the black hole of doom. But know that there is a recruiter or a sourcer or someone that is tasked with looking at your resume. So there are no bots that are pulling your resumes out. It's a person and that is a recruiter's job. And going more into that, people versus machines. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, so what are the people doing, be it the sourcer or the recruiter? They're reviewing all applications and they're dispositioning candidates. Do some recruiters disposition every one of their applicants? They don't. They don't. They, they, they work around that because I will post a job on LinkedIn. I did this for a client. I posted two jobs on LinkedIn. I had them up for 36 hours. 
I got like 235 applicants. Two were worth a screen. They were so off because people are like, easy apply, easy apply, easy apply. And it's like, not qualified, not qualified, not qualified. And so, you know, someone saw customer success. They forgot to read engineer and they're like, I work at the Marriott at the front desk. Well, I'm sure that person has amazing customer service skills and I'm positive they're not an engineer. So people are reviewing all applicants and they're dispositioning candidates. People make hire and no hire decisions. Hiring managers decide who they're going to hire on their team. Recruiters um, can sometimes good ones will influence that or advise around that. People write job descriptions. They try to make them inclusive at good companies. They, they try to make them sound really great. So you want to work there. Um, people advise candidates and managers. Recruiters want to fill their roles. Um, so they want to help you get it if they think you're a good fit. And people are confined to the systems that their companies have adopted. So they are working in their own systems. So what do the systems do? What, 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 what is handled by bots? Uh, this, we, I mentioned the applicant tracking system. It houses all recruiting information from application to hire. Uh, and sometimes there's systems around the sourcing piece. Uh, some systems do pre-screening. So they'll ask qualifying questions. Do you have five years of Java? Have you sold a more than $100,000 worth of products. So there, some companies do have pre-screening or qualification bots that will move you to the next bucket. Um, so answer those questions. Some systems will send batch emails or batch texts to candidates, either with updates or with marketing material or with declines so that, uh, or with sourcing like, are you interested? So there are systems that send batch emails. And when you get one that says, hi, first name, somebody botched something. Um, and systems can schedule. So like I have Calendly, which is my favorite thing ever. So I send it out and people schedule themselves and I don't have to worry about it. If you want more information on people versus machines, <laughs> and what they do. There is a recruiter out there. She works for Amazon. Her name is Amy Miller. She has a YouTube page and she's all about debunking myths. So I highly recommend listening to Amy. All right, we're getting to the nitty gritty of it all. Um, there are a lot of different kinds of recruiters out there and it's really important to you to know who you're talking to, what their influences are, and what their motivations are. Um, are they really looking for a great fit or are they really looking for money? It depends. And are they just a salesperson or are they really doing this in your best interest? Will they be able to get feedback? Will they know where things are in the process? So let's, let's go deep. Um, in-house recruiters. We've talked about them a little bit. The way they're paid, they get a salary plus bonus. And if they're at certain kinds of companies, they might get equity. They're there for the long haul. They're a 40 plus hour a week employee. Um, and they usually are given to a few hiring managers. So you work like, I'm a recruiter for the finance department, or I'm a recruiter for the engineering department or IT. So again, depending on how big the company is, depends how many hiring managers and teams they may work with. Um, generally, they work with people for a long time, so they get to know them and they build influence over the process as they do it. Um, and they're that major project manager. They're the owner of the recruiting process. And they really want the best fit because they're going to have to work with the person. They're going to have to know them and see them after they get hired. So the in-house people, while they're sometimes held to metrics around time to fill and things like that, they're mostly held to metrics around their hiring manager's happiness, their candidate's happiness with their performance and things like that. Uh, and like their time to respond and stuff like that are other metrics that recruiters can be held at at different companies. So that's in-house. Those are the people that work for the company. 
Um, I'm going to go to hourly and RPO next. That's sort of what my company does. So what we do is we come in when a company is too small to have a recruiting team or when their recruiting team is totally overwhelmed. And we look just like an in-house recruiter. So my lead recruiters and sourcer have they have company emails and they and we're long term, like we'll be with companies for a couple of years sometimes. And so we really want best fit. We work with them. We're super transparent. We're, we're just fabulous. Um, and so my company is an hourly. There are recruiting process organizations that sometimes it's like outsourced recruiting. They may not be as close to the client as somebody like us, but all these um, hourly or RPO, they're consultants and they're paid hourly or sometimes on a monthly retainer on behalf of the clients. So they're similar to in-house most of the time, uh, but they want long-term fit because you don't want to be hired by a company and then be fired by a company and have to find new companies. So it's more of a long-term relationship. Contingent search is, is my least favorite. I'll be super honest. Um, they are 100% commission-based. So think about that for a minute. They're only paid when someone's hired. So a contingent, if you're thinking about one role versus another and one's got a contingent recruiter, are they going to be like, no, take the other, it's a better fit. And then they get nothing for any time they've worked with you, all the time they've worked on the job. They, um, they don't get paid if you don't get hired. And so their mortgage re relies on you saying yes. Not that there aren't some amazing contingent recruiters out there. My podcast partner, I have a podcast called Real Job Talk, another place that you can find lots of job and job search information. Um, she started in contingent church, contingent search. She said it was a great place. Sorry, Austin allergies. It was a great place to get started and, and get and cut her teeth. It, it can be a good thing, but Things to know, they only get paid when you take the job. That's really important. And they're competing sometimes against five, six, seven other firms to get a candidate in. So if I'm not guaranteed to pay you, I might call my job out to a few different firms and see, see who gets me the first one. What doesn't hurt me at all. Like if you don't get, if one contingent search firm doesn't get me a candidate, but this one gets me three, like, why do I care? Which is kind of stinky because people are, should be working on your roles, but they're, they're not motivated to be quality. They're motivated to be fast and quantity and to get people submitted so that they're the first one in. So the problem with this isn't the people necessarily, it's on how the business is set up. And so if you find out someone's contingent, you just have to know that maybe they can get you submitted for your dream job, but you have to know that they may not be exclusively working on it. They may not even be asked to work on it. Sometimes some contingent firms will um, reach out to people for jobs that they haven't been asked to work on. I've had that so many times, like, hey, I've got the perfect person for your software engineer job. I'm like, I didn't ask you to find me that. I'm not paying your fee. So I don't look at the resume because I'm not paying the fee on it. So it's something to be aware of. And we're going to get to how you know in a second. Lastly, there's retain search. Retain search are usually industry experts. They're usually like we do investment management retain search, or we do engineering leadership retain search. Usually retain search is more at the executive level. They're paid a retainer and then 60 days out, they usually get a buck. The others 25, sorry, 25% retainer, 25% in somewhere in the middle and 50% when the person is hired. So they are, usually very incentivized to fill the role, but they're there to do a good job. Uh, usually they know a lot about the role. They know a lot about the organization. They're more thorough and they don't carry that many roles on their plate at a time because of the high quality that they're expected to give. For so where with retained, if you're working with a retained search firm, is that they can have hands-off lists. 
So if they're getting to know you and talking to you to either have you in their database or they have something in mind, if your dream company is Twitter and they've done a search for Twitter in the last 18 months, they, or I should say, if you're coming out of Twitter and they're, and they may not be able to work with pulling people out of Twitter. So they have hands off lists of past clients that they can't pull from. And so you just need to know if they can talk to you. Um, but that's more for people who are looking to switch jobs. So the big question is, how do I know who's on the phone? Uh, well, you ask. I love it when people are like, so how do you work with Auditoria? Well, I am technically a consultant, but we work like an internal team. And as you can see, I have an Auditoria email address and we, you know, I've been working with them for over a year and a half. So you ask, how well do you know the team, the hiring team? Tell me about them. How long have you worked with them? Um, are you exclusively working on this job or are there others? And so when you ask them what kind of cert or what, you can understand their motivation. You could also be kind of detective-y and see who they work for and figure it out that way. But I think for you to be working for yourselves to help understand your own job search, you need to know who's on the phone so that you can really determine how they can help you and what they can do for you and what they can't. If I'm a contingent recruiter and I, I'm one of five companies it was it was called out to, I can throw your resume in, but am I going to have that deep relationship with the hiring manager and be able to influence? No. Also, because of the way that they're paid, a hiring manager may not really take their advice very seriously because of course they want you hired. They want the payday. So you need to know who you're working with and to know their sphere of influence. favorite, favorite uh, show of mine. Uh, so how do I learn what the company is really like? Because now, Liz, you're telling me that there's some recruiters that they're really out for the payday or whatever. How do I, and like, you're telling me there are employment branding people that make everything look shiny and wonderful. Like, how do I find out what a company is really like to work at? And if it's going to be a good fit for me? Well, Glassdoor is a place to start and it's totally fine, but it's not enough because sometimes companies will give incentives to their people to put reviews on Glassdoor. When you, right, you want people to want to work with you. Uh, the best way is to talk to people. So if you're looking to work at Dell, who do you know that works there? Is there a friend of a friend, a second degree connection? Could you ask for 10 minutes of their time? And then ask some really good questions. Ask to talk to someone in your interview process that does the same role that you're going to be doing, just to see what it's really like. Hey, you're also an accountant at Dell. I'm picking on Dell. Uh, at Dell. What's it like to be an accountant at Dell? What are the busy seasons? How do they divide up responsibilities? Um, how do you keep people updated, especially if everybody's remote? How do you all stay on the same page? What tools do you use? Um, maybe some questions like, how many hours a day do you usually find yourself working? And uh, so when you go on vacation, are you expected to log in or do they really encourage you to unplug? Maybe find someone that you know that left that group. Those people really understand stuff and they, they can really spill the beans on what's going on. So throughout your interview process, you are going to be asking questions about what it's really like to work there in a really upbeat and I just want to know about it kind of way. But there's no problem with asking the questions that are going to help you determine what it's really like. Another question that is a favorite of mine is around values. So our employment branding friends are gonna have all the company values and everyone's having fun on the website. So tell me how those values show up in your everyday work life. You say you really value work-life balance. How many hours a week do you find yourself working? 
What are your busy seasons? How does the company feel about time off? Um, will the company, will people, are there other parents at this company? Do other people leave early for their kids' activities? So ask those questions in a really good, curious way. So where else can you find information about job seeking and companies and all of those things while well, you're here? And that is great. And there was, Kathy shared some wonderful information earlier and some really good resources. Um, there are a lot of career podcasts out there. Um, Kathy mentioned Michelle Olivier, who I work with, um, and she has an awesome podcast out there called, um, it, I can't remember what it's called, something, tell me about your job, and she, it's so good. I have a podcast called Real Job Talk, where we talk about all kinds of things with jobs, and Kat, my co-podcaster, uh, co, co and I, we are both recruiting HR people, so you learn a lot about the job search process. Uh, there's the voice of job speakers. There's Career Cloud Radio. There's no BS job search advice radio. Uh, and I already pointed you to Amy Miller's YouTube. There's a bunch of websites, some of which Kathy was talking about earlier, like built in, where you can learn about um, learn about different companies. Know that when you see a company featured on a place like Built In or a place like The Muse or a place like Indeed, they've paid for that. They're not featured because they're just cool. They're featured because they gave thousands of dollars to be featured. And that's not a bad thing. Like, it's great. It, that's how the world goes around. But they pay for that. And I think that's a really important thing for you to know and understand so that you can be a savvy job seeker. All right. That is the information. My goal was to kind of pull back the curtain and teach you a little bit about what is out there in terms of the world of recruiting. I wanted to leave plenty of time uh, for Q&A because I want you to be able to ask anything. There are no silly questions. Um, so I, I guess you can unmute yourself and ask me whatever you want. I am an open book about job. I, I know a lot about the job search process, the recruiting process, and pretty much all things related to getting a new job. Um, let me talk. This is Kathy. Let me uh, start by reading you a, a question that, that Mark put in the chat. First, he said he realized that one of the people he's been talking to lately is a contingent recruiter. And then he, when you were asking about all of those questions, questions, how many hours do you work and all that? He said, getting the inside scoop. He said, these are all questions you ask after you receive a job offer, right? No, not necessarily. I mean, I, I think you can ask in stages, right? You should be asking questions throughout your interview process. So I really appreciate that, Mark, because you're right. You should know you know what you're getting into before you sign on the dotted line but i think when you're first screened by the recruiter for example you can ask what's it like to work there you know some really broad questions but you should be asking every single person you talk to so what's been your experience here how do you find the culture you know how do you find work-life balance whatever your touch points are get your data because here's here's a big moment, right? Your life changes when you take a new job. There's don't. So you've got to do the research and get the information you need in order to make this decision for you. If you find out in interview number two that the person you're talking to hasn't been allowed to take a vacation in two years, see ya. I'm out. This isn't going to work for me. So you're job as a job seeker is to be a, is to gather data. I'm a mom. I've got two kids. If my kid barfs, I'm out and picking them up. If that's not okay, then I'm not working for you. That's it. It's over. I don't need any more interviews. So why waste your time and theirs if it's, if it's a no-go? So I would ask broad questions with the recruiter phase. I would ask job questions as well as culture questions with the hiring manager. And then 
ask, have your questions ready for each individual person you're going to meet with. And some are around their role in the job and some are around what's it like to work here and be prepared. I like cringe when I have candidates uh, go through and the manager's like, they had no questions. How can you not have questions? You're committing 40 hours a week of your life to this place. How can you not have questions? So make sure that you're getting your answers and that it's lining up with what you're looking for in a job. And if you listen to the podcast, you'll hear Kat and I, we talk all the time about your must have list for jobs. What what do you need, both in terms of the work, because the work's super important, right? So what do you need in terms of the work, but also what do you need in terms of the culture or for me, I need to be able to pick up the barfer or whatever it is in terms of travel or in terms of commute or in terms of tools or whatever it is. So if you have your must-have list really tight, you can ask questions to make sure the job lines up. Okay, here's a question. Um, If a contingent recruiter is uh, presenting you, you know, you're their candidate and and they, I guess it's a contingent recruiter. It could possibly also be the the retained, I suppose. So the retained one where they say, okay, we are presenting you. um, We've made changes a little bit to your resume. We're presenting you and and our salary is based on on what what they're going to pay you. We get a yeah. percentage of that. Sure. <clears throat> so having a person like that who acts as your agent. So they have a they have a vested interest mm-hmm. in having you not only get hired, but having you get the, a very good deal. Yes, yeah. they're going to get a percentage of it. Yep. So uh, figuring out having somebody like that who's who wants a p- a piece of your action yeah. uh, seems like a good thing because because they have your best interests at heart. Mm. Um, is it fair to if somebody reaches out to you to to say were you requested to come up with candidates or did you just hear about this opening? And they are of course if you ask a question like that, what's the best way to ask it? And then <gasps> excuse me, have the hiccups. And then uh, how to um, how do you determine whether I mean, they can easily just say, yes, I was requested whether they were or not. Yeah. Right. Ultimately, there has to be a bit of trust at some point, right? Like if people lie to you, I can't, I, you know, those people can deal with it when they look in the mirror. But I think you can say, what's your relationship with the company or what's your relationship with the hiring manager? Now, if this person has an internal email address, you know, they're not contingent search. They're just not. You know, so so you can do a little digging, but genuinely, if the person has a company email address, you know that they're much tighter in than the people who don't. So you can just say, what's your relationship? Oh, how well do you know the hiring manager? Tell me about them. Uh, well, uh, I've never really spoken with them. Uh, 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 ding, 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 flag. So um, that's, those are the kinds of questions you can ask. Just, you're really being curious. You want to know more. Is this a good fit for you? Oh, you don't know the hiring manager. Interesting. So you can't really tell me a lot about the job because no one's ever talked to you about it. That person's not going to have a lot of influence. And so to the compensation piece, you can always ask, what does this job pay? Generally, you may get an answer like, We're looking to pay market or above market, but it depends on experience. And that is all true. If I'm hiring someone because I think they have the aptitude, but they don't have the actual skills, I'm going to pay them less than the person with both the aptitude and the skills, right? So sometimes there's a range in what level I can hire. Sometimes there's not. Um, But always ask for a range. Uh, Again, a contingent person may not know the range or they might. It just depends on what they know. So while a contingent person wants you to make the most because they get a percentage, they also want to get paid, period. So if you get 90 or you get 100 and you're their candidate, they're getting paid. If you get no offer, they get zero. So they'd rather get something than nothing. So 
Well, yes, of course, they'd love you to get more. So go negotiate and they'll be paid more. Um, their whole goal is not to get zero. And uh, when, when you get contacted by multiple uh, recruiters from different uh, companies, uh, is there, uh, obviously you don't wanna be, ref uh, if, you, if you've already been referred or whatever, you're talking to somebody about the same job, yeah. uh, how do you uh, navigate that? Oh my gosh, I can't believe you thought of me for that too, Kathy. I'm actually already talking to them. Thank you so much though. A contingent firm, you'll, you'll hear the click because then they can't get you in and they can't get paid. Because also a contingent firm is also up against the database. And so often it will say if the person's already in the database or if we've talked to them in the last year, they don't get paid. They only get paid if it's a new person that the company's never touched before. It is a ugly, it's a business I wouldn't touch with a 10 foot pole because of that. So, um, so you just, you say that and then they're not going to be interested because they won't get paid. But if you're savvy and you can work it into a conversation, so funny, another recruiter reached out for me about this. I must be the perfect fit. Hmm. Must be. Uh, we had a, we had a, um, some years ago, we had a, a recruiter give a talk here. And he said, when he was talking about in-house recruiters, he said, they are not your friend. They are not the friend of the job seeker. Uh, they represent the company. And if they find, if they have a hint of anything, um, uh, for example, if you, if you let, uh, let it be known that you have uh, oh, I don't even know, like a, like a medical condition or um, that you might have a bad reference. Is that going to be an issue? Uh, whatever you say to them, uh, it's like passing information on to the enemy that they will, uh, they'll red flag you or they, they won't put you forward because you have issues. Right. I mean, so first of all, please don't have references that won't say nice things about you. Um, that's not a good choice. So have references that you know will glow. Um, but they are there to evaluate fit for the company, which doesn't mean that they don't necessarily care, but they're evaluating best fit. So if I've got a person who's being, who may be the best developer on the planet, but they're being nasty to me or, you know, hold me back if they're being nasty to my coordinator. And I always tell my coordinators, you tell me who's respectful and who's kind. Um, then yeah, they're going to, they're going to say, we don't want to work with this person. We don't want this person around red flag. And with the medical issues, that's discrimination and they better not. That's putting the company at a lot of risk. So absolutely not. If they ask, do you need any accommodations? That's a very legal and understandable question. You've got to ask if someone needs accommodations, you have to provide reasonable accommodations. Um, but I would say the internal recruiter is not, they're not your friend. Their job is to fill the role with the best people possible. Your job is to show them that you're the best person possible. <clears throat> okay, uh, we have just a comment, I guess. Sure. Somebody said that if you, if you get called by a contingent person that you could say, I may have already applied for this position. Uh, can you tell me more? Can you give me more details? And if they're really mysterious about it, uh, then it's a red flag for moving that's, forward. With them. That's something you can totally say because if you've applied, they can't get paid. But if you're like, ooh, that sounds great, it can't hurt you to be put in by them necessarily. And it's up to, you know, and then if you talk to someone internally, you say, you know, I applied for this, but then they reached out and that's up to them to negotiate. That is not your problem. Um, this person says, is the contingent ones, the ones that make you sign or respond to an email uh, for the right to represent? Hmm. I've not seen that probably. It might also be retained because of the whole way retained works. Usually retained search will present three candidates for the role or four candidates for the role um, versus ongoing. Uh, so it's possible, but 
I would, that smells contingent to me because again, they want to be like mine. I get paid on that. Forget any. So if I get mine in and ABC recruiting gets it in 10 minutes later, mine, mine, mine. And that's my candidate. I have it in writing. So that smells very contingent to me. Here's one. Um, we used to have a, a person coming uh, quite frequently to the launch pad meetings and they said what made them, they were a staffing uh, company and they, they did a lot of technical jobs and they did a lot of jobs at Dell. And they said they were different from most uh, staffing companies in that uh, most staffing companies, their primary uh, relationship is with the companies, the employers, because they're the ones that paid them. Sure. But they wanted to also create a really solid relationship with job seekers because they knew that if they had talented people and they had good relationships, that they would be able to place them over and over and over. And, sure. and so there's that. And then this new this person has said, um, how do I begin working with a recruiter? We have people every once in a while that say they want to, they want to find a recruiter who will um, represent them or whatever. Yes. Uh, does that only happen in the in senior level executive positions where you actually have a recruiter that is advocating for you? Yeah. <clears throat> and I mean, you them money. I you know Ari Gold does not exist in uh, <laughs> in recruiting. So people are like, oh, can you get me into Facebook? And I'm like, no, I'm not working with Facebook. Like I'm paid to work with the clients that hire me. And that's often the case now, especially contingent are only as strong as their database. And I actually knew someone who was going to a contingent firm because she had been misled to go there. And they said, it's like shooting fish in a barrel because their database was so great that it's shooting fish in a barrel to get good candidates. Wow. No candidate experience, no, you know, no caring about the people. It's resume, resume. Oh, you want Java? Here's five Java resumes. And there you go. Yeah. So often recruiters want to pad their database with your resumes. And honestly, like, is that the worst thing ever to have your resume in a database that maybe you'll be put in for a job that you want? I don't think so. But, and there's the big but, do you trust the person? Oh, I found the perfect job for you. Oh my God, it's awesome. I've already sent it to the hiring manager. It's such a good fit. Oh, really? Tell me more. Why? <laughs> and so know that when someone says, I just, I, I want to get to know you, that's great. And what they're doing is they're pre-qualifying you so that if they get a job that matches your skill set, they can chuck you in there so fast, your head will spin. So that's what that is about. Again, there are recruiters who will send unsolicited resumes. It must work for some of them because they do it constantly. But I've literally never heard a story in almost 20 years of recruiting that where it worked. Because if I don't call it out, I don't want to pay a fee. And I probably don't have the approval to pay a fee. So I'm not. Right. And lot, <clears throat> obviously, lots of companies say we will not accept resumes from <clears throat> third-party recruiters or whatever, unauthorized third-party recruiters. Well, um, exactly, because they see it posted on LinkedIn and they're like, oh, Kathy, I saw your job posting. Here's here's eight, eight resumes. Look at them, please, and pay me for them. And you're like, no, I've got my internal process. I don't need your help. I only call things out when I can't handle it or can't find the people. Okay, here's a question. If you do sign or they ask you to sign mm -hmm. uh, an agreement for them to represent. So right to represent is the real thing. Yeah. <clears throat> Do, this person says, is it only for the particular job or is it for any jobs out there? I gotta tell you, I don't, this whole right to represent thing kind of makes my stomach turn. Yeah. Uh, I'm not liking it because I don't, for you job seekers, I don't want you limited by anything, right? This, I want you to be able to apply, like, I don't want you to be caught by a contract that you can't look at another job or that you have to be submitted by this person, like that feels ick because again, this person doesn't 
hasn't been asked to submit for a lot of jobs that you might want. So what I would do is if I got asked to sign one of those, I would ask some really poignant questions around what is, is does this only apply to this job at this company? Like, what does this mean for you to represent me? Who would you be representing me to? Would this limit my ability to go other places, et cetera, et cetera? So what you, the answers you want is in order for me to submit you for XYZ job at ABC company, I need you to sign this. Okay, cool. I'll I'll sign this. You know, everyone has a right to make a living. Here you go. If they say, no, I'm going to send your resume all over the place and I'm going to, I'm, I'm your agent. Uh, I don't like it. Okay, we have two more questions from um, a person who's a career coach. She says, is your primary tool LinkedIn for recruiters or is it your company ATS? Well, LinkedIn has an ATS. So you can buy their applicant tracking system, of course. LinkedIn would love you to always use LinkedIn. They're a business. And that's, you know, just FYI. Every job you see posted on LinkedIn for the most part costs like 400 bucks a month. It's really expensive to post jobs on LinkedIn. I don't do it because I told you how it got me such great candidates last time I did it. Um, So you can use that as your ATS. I would say the primary tool an internal recruiter works with is the company applicant tracking system because they, the, The key thing for the applicant tracking system is that it keeps the company compliant. There are audits and things like that that to to show that you're not discriminating and things like that that companies need to evaluate for. And so the applicant tracking system is the place of record. LinkedIn Recruiter is generally a recruiter tool to source and find and reach out to candidates. That is different from the applicant tracking system. As I just said, LinkedIn does have its own applicant tracking system, which of course, when you find them, then you can put them in and, you know, that's why, that's what they want to sell to you. Okay. And then this other one says, as a recruiter, are you less impressed with easy apply than with a website application? No, I don't really care. I, you know, if you're qualified for the job, I want your resume. If it's easier, if you see the job on LinkedIn, I mean, I guess I want it. Let me back up. If I'm a hiring leader, I want to see what source is giving me the best bang for my buck and the best candidates for my job. So if I see that 75% of our hires are from LinkedIn recruiter and, and posting on LinkedIn, like, oh, LinkedIn is, you know, awesome. Whereas if I'm finding it's from Indeed, or if I'm finding it's from our company site, like that's good data for me. So I guess if I'm speaking from the leadership perspective, I want you to apply where you see the job. At the end of the day, it's candidate soup in there. And like one isn't prioritized over the other. Okay. All right, good to know. Uh, um, I, I did have a question. Oh, yeah. I was typing it in, but I know things are going to be shut down soon. Um, yeah. I um, Recently, I found a job on LinkedIn, but then when I was doing the research on the company, I saw that they had a place I could apply directly to them, right. which I did. And in the process of going through their um, AI system, if you want to think of it, Yep. It asked, where did you find it? And I told them LinkedIn. Right. But I just want to know how ethical it was for me to do what I did. 100%. You're okay. all good. You're all good. Because again, so I, I'm putting on my recruiting leader hat. Oh, great. That LinkedIn posting got her to apply. So I don't care that you applied through the website because you said where you found it. And the reason for asking where you found it is to, is to track which investments are best for them. So you're good. I have a question. So Um, as a recruiter, um, is it irritating to you if a candidate figures out who the hiring manager is and goes directly to them too? You have to ask that question. Um, I want to say no, because I love my candidates to be resourceful. Now, I also don't, I want you to respect the process, right? And so 
I want you to, and this is for me who has spent the majority of her career as an internal person. So I am trustworthy. I'm so transparent. So if I say, hey, I'm going to show you to the hiring manager. I want you to trust me that I'm doing that, which I am if I say that, right? And then I want you to trust me to get back to you. And if you're a good fit, set you up with the hiring manager. So do I want you to circumvent me and like go to them directly when I said I'd go to them? I don't because that kind of undermines me. That said, you applied online, you haven't heard anything, you're in the black hole of doom and you figure out who the hiring manager is and you go directly, power to you, you're advocating for yourself. So I kind of feel like as a recruiter, if I didn't engage and I missed the opportunity to present you, then advocate for yourself. But on the other side, if you're already working with me, at least trust the process. Also, I don't Remember when we were talking in the beginning, like my job is to manage this process because my hiring manager's busy. So I am the guardian of them. And so I don't want them spammed by candidates. So I know that's a like conflicting answer to my, to your question, but I think you just have to be careful. And if you do reach out to a hiring manager, you really want to make sure you're a good fit. Like you really want to have most of the stuff on that list of qualifications so you don't waste their time and annoy them okay i have one last question i think you have sure. about three minutes we're good <laughs> um we had a, a speaker who was a um he's kind of like you i think in that i think his company uh re is a retained co recruiter company yep. and he's a tech recruiter and he uh gave a talk at launchpad where he said uh, when he finds people, he'll send out a, you know, uh, let's say 30 emails and he'll say, I'm trying to fill this position with this particular kind of company. Mm -hmm. uh, you came up if you're interested, uh, please send me your resume. Yep. Uh, and then he said on his emails, he always puts, you know, his closing, he puts his name and his email and his phone number. Sure. And he says, guess how many people Lots of, he says, maybe two thirds of those people I reach out to will send me their resumes, mm -hmm. some with a cover letter, some without. And then he says, guess how many follow up with a phone call? None. Like practically none. And he yep. said, he said, right now I'm looking to fill this position. And he said, I just sent out 50 letters. I got 30 back. And he said, of those people, one called me up and, and followed up and had some questions. And he said, I'm going to coffee with him as soon as I finish this talk. Good. So he information available to you. Reach out and ask questions and start creating a relationship with your technical recruiter. Sure. And um, and is that something that you should do only for that kind of retained recruiter situation? Because you've already said how busy everybody is. Yeah. No. It's it. I think he asked for. It. He asked to connect, right? He said, please connect with me. If someone's saying, please connect with me, take that opportunity 100%. Are there people out there building their databases and that's why they want to connect and they may not have a job for you right now? Absolutely. But if they're an authentic good person, they're authentically trying to build their database. So my recruiting process, and I told you about my sourcer, David, who is you know, the key to the operation, he sends out a, a um, series of three emails trying to engage someone. Hey, we have this great job. This is why we think you're a good fit, et cetera. And then trying to get them to talk with my lead recruiter. Some people say I'm interested and then they don't schedule themselves with the lead recruiter or whatever. It's about getting someone on the hook. So I think if someone wants your contact information and wants to talk to you about a job, why not talk to them? You're looking for a job. That said, know how much influence they have over the job to know if they really can submit you, et cetera. But yeah, if someone's saying, I want to meet up with you, I want to talk to you, I want to get to know you, why wouldn't you take that opportunity? Well, he doesn't really say that. He just puts his phone number there. Uh, but he's always impressed when they, when they follow up in that way. Yeah, for sure. He might want to change his messaging then if he wants more people to talk to him. <laughs> well, it's kind of a, it's, it's kind of, he, he just encourages people to be more proactive. For sure. Uh, the title of his presentation to Launchpad was 
waiting is not a job search strategy? I'm on board. I'm on board with that um, for sure. But again, you want to be targeted, right? You don't want to spray everywhere. You want to be targeted like, oh, wow. Hey, you're the recruiter at XYZ company. I'm really interested in XYZ company. And I have all of this qualification for this job that you're recruiting for all day long, twice on Sunday. Like, yes, I'd love to talk to you.